Welcome to Tutti a Casa, uh, live chats about everything Italian. And tonight's guest is Ruth Ben Ghiat, professor of history and Italian studies at New York University. For full disclosure, one of my favorite colleagues. We have known each other for a few years now. We met at a conference at Stanford called Fascinating Fascism. And fascism indeed remained a fascinating subject of study for Professor Ben Ghiat, who has become the authority on uh, fascism and not only about Italian fascism in the US and beyond. She's currently working, she just finished writing a book on totalitarian regimes or she, as she likes to call it, on strong men. The reason we invited Ruth tonight here to be with us for Tutti a Casa is uh, of course due to the fact that in the present situation, uh, it seems that totalitarian uh, temptations can arise uh, more than under normal circumstances. In particular, um, we are talking about the Hungarian case where the president uh, decided to basically rule by decree and was able to obtain the approval of parliament to do so. So, Ruth, the pandemic that we are going through right now seems to be uh, the petri dish to cultivate totalitarian temptations. And uh, the Hungarian case is a very strong and very important one. So why don't we start with that and then we'll proceed following your, um, your studies of totalitarianism and your deconstruction, how it works and how we can stop it and prevent it. So what's going on in Hungary and why is that important for all of us, even if we live far from Hungary? The Hungar Hungarian case is, um, it's, it's the, it's the most chilling case in a way because Orban has been in power since 2010. He has not used mass incarceration like Erdogan in Turkey. He has used targeted violence, but he has used much less than uh, Putin, for example. And yet he's been able to completely domesticate the country uh, from the press to the judiciary and now Parliament, which uh, passed this, uh, this measure uh, that he's allowed to rule by decree, um, and there is no end date in sight. And one thing I want to uh, feature is that this kind of crisis, this happens to be a pandemic, but authoritarians have always used crises to uh, take advantage of these situations and do what they wanted to do anyway. So Orban had declared a state of emergency in 2015 for the refugee crisis, and it never went away. So this is one thing. When they declare emergencies, they don't usually revoke them because it's too convenient for them. The one thing Orban didn't have was the ability to stay in power forever. And as of very recently, he now has that. Um, and he also, along with that, passed a measure that you can go to prison for five years for, quote, fake news, which is, of course, anything that doesn't help the government. So it's a very sad time in Hungary. And about a month ago, uh, I was interviewed for a front page story uh, on what the editor wrote to me saying, this is the last independent daily newspaper in Hungary. And that gave me chills. It gives me chills right now. Um, because it's, it's a very sad story, but it's one that's happened over a period of years, kind of drip, drip, drip. So that is how authoritarian starts today. It's not as much a coup like with Mobutu and Pinochet in Chile, and it's not as much with black shirts on the street like fascism. So it's more insidious and it happens over time. And the Hungarian situation, of course, it targeted journalists, academics, the, the entire university system. Uh, but as you uh, reminded us, he was elected, as were other uh, strong men that you have studied uh, throughout your career, including Mussolini and, uh, and Hitler. So we'll take a little detour and then we go back to the pandemic as a state of exception, uh, as Agamben would have defined it. Um, is there a difference in the way in which these strong men uh, come to power, keep power, uh, and eventually are outed of it if it ever happens, depending whether they are elected or whether they come to power in a more violent way, like with the military coup or in any other situation like that. One of the things my research showed for this book, Strongman, is that there is an authoritarian playbook. That's what I call it. And it has tools. 
of propaganda. And recently at the Casa Italiana, we had a wonderful exhibit, exhibit on fascist propaganda. Um, it has corruption, which is not just financial corruption, but I define as getting people to become complicit and collaborate with you because these leaders are nothing without their Mitch McConnells in our country and uh, all of their, their kind of co-conspirators. They use violence, which can mean something very different these days than the fascist era. And I also uh, found they use virility. So the macho body, uh, the cult of male force is very important. So these tools, the outcomes of them change over a century. So um, there's less genocide uh, in, in general today. There's more mass incarceration, like Trump has is doing with uh, Latino migrants or Erdogan does. But the tools themselves stay exactly the same, and the psychological processes of the dynamics of the leader-follower relationship stay the same. So that, uh, that is a very interesting finding. Uh, Ruth, tell us something more about this idea of virility. Uh, it's not by chance that you decide to call your book Strong Men. Uh, <laughs> so first off the bat, are there any strong women in history uh, that would be the equivalent? And why is virility such a central point in the totalitarian uh, playbook? That's a really interesting question. So I'm, I'm dealing with 20, 20th and 21st century leaders. As, as we all know, including in Italian history, there were lots of uh, strong, di diabolical, evil uh, women in the past. Um, but in terms of, uh, I'm only featuring leaders who wrecked uh, a democracy or, or degraded a democracy. So I have Hitler and Mussolini, I have Franco, Mobutu, in the Congo, uh, up to Erdogan, uh, Putin. So there have been women like Margaret Thatcher, who was known as the Iron Lady, uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain, but she didn't degrade or destroy democracy. Now, I do conclude that uh, things are changing. There are a lot of women in the global right, the far right today. And I do believe that in the future, we will see a woman at the head of an authoritarian state. But so the book is a reflection on this kind of uh, use of male, the cult of male force, which is very much a part of their charisma. When you see Trump and Orban together or Trump and Putin, it's a certain style of rule which depends on this kind of brute force, this idea of brute force. And, and that's what we're dealing with today. And uh, Ruth, so will a woman ever uh, adopt, should be able to, to become the equivalent of the strong man? Will she have to adopt somehow this virility style or will she have to invent a completely different uh, mode of communication? And uh, tell us about the different ways in which uh, Trump uh, embraces virility or fakes it and the way in which uh, the leaders of the past did it. So I th what I conclude in the book is that um, all of the other um, tools will go on. If you had, like Ivanka Trump, very uh, frighteningly, people tell me when I s tweet this or I say it on TV that they don't sleep, but Ivanka Trump is being marketed as a future uh, president, and Trump has inserted her, for example, into numerous world photo, world head of state, uh, global leader, you know, photos. It's very obvious. So let's say if she takes over one day. Um, the kind of virility where Trump sits with Orban and says, oh, we're twins, that's not going to go on. But all of the other uh, tools, the, the locking up migrants, everything else, the corruption, certainly, uh, she's a money laundress, you know, we know that, will go on. Um, so there's, there's not much hope in that. In terms of, it's been very interesting to see Trump uh, in, in this coronavirus, and he has used misinformation, he's using corruption. Now, he's a noted germaphobe. He's afraid of uh, diseases and germs. Uh, he's always been like that. He doesn't like to shake hands. It's been known for 30 years. So was Hitler. So was Gaddafi. Um, this is a kind of, I don't want to exaggerate that it's a trait of these men, but many of them are germaphobes. And yet, it's been very puzzling to people because Trump was sitting there shaking hands. He was touching people. He refused to wear gloves or a mask. Now, so the, the secret of that is that he has to seem virile. And, he, and these leaders also have to be anointed as somehow 
irreproachable, invincible, untouchable. And so when, uh, you know, Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, and so many other evangelical uh, Christians say that Trump was put in uh, office by the will of God. So if Trump starts to wear a mask, uh, if, he, if he seems to be not invincible, his virility will be tarnished. So he, it's been a very interesting thing he's done where he's touching everyone all the time. Uh, and that's to seem like omnipotent, which is very, very important to this male cult of force. That's very interesting. So his germophobia had to give up to his desire to project this image of the strong man, these super, superhuman, virile, not afraid of anything. Um, exactly the time in which everybody stopped shaking hands, he started showing this uh, nonchalance in disrespecting actual the social distancing measure, measures that are being proposed or imposed throughout the world. Uh, my next question, Ruth, regards the specific situation. So we're going back to the pandemic and the situation in which we are. This is definitely a, an exceptional situation by all means. Uh, the world has never found itself in these conditions. So there are really needs um, to uh, impose measures, as the case of Italy, or propose them in other countries, uh, enforce them in different ways that limit our constitutional rights, the freedoms to which we have been accustomed uh, throughout the decades. Um, is there any sign of when these measures are becoming too dangerously similar to the ones you found in the playbook for the strong men? Or when should we start being concerned uh, that these measures are not simply justified by the pandemic, but they might prelude to something else? It's a great question. It, it's all about the intention of the ruler. If you have a democratic government and a democratic leader that who cares about the public good, and the public good and public service is his or her end point, that's the goal, then Measures which are passed, which may temporarily uh, curtail our movement, even some people might think our civil rights, uh, surveying uh, our telecommunications, are unpleasant and they may be objectionable, but with a ruler who cares about the public good, they are done to protect the public. When you have a ruler like an Orban or a Trump, who's made it very clear, he said the other day, I have total power. He actually finally came out and said it. He said he's not constrained by Congress. He's not constrained by states authorities, states rights. He has total power. When you have someone like that, uh, then it's very clear that the measures to curtail civil rights and movement and everything else are going to be used not for the public good, because Trump thinks that we serve him. He doesn't think that he serves us. That's been clear. So it's all about intention. And, and the danger is that in these periods of exception, somebody like that will take advantage and his co-conspirators. So one thing that was very frightening to me uh, a few weeks ago, Attorney General Barr, who is one of the main villains, he's one of the top two or three villains of this administration, he asked Congress if he could have permission to detain people indefinitely without trial. And this is one of the cardinal things that every authoritarian regime does when it's, when it's in the push, the final push to, to become authoritarian. So the, the bad intentions are, are on display. They're there for everyone to see, as is the misinformation. So you have to think every single thing Trump says and does, it's with the goal of enriching himself out of public office and staying in power indefinitely, just like Orban. And uh, Ruth, the main difference between Orban and Trump, of course, is that he finds himself in a, in a, in a, in a federal uh, structure that has a long history of checks and balances with the judiciary that is still partly independent, if even if he has tried desperately to control it in different in the different ways that we know, and a, a network of governors that are not of the same political persuasion that he is, and that are actually pushing uh, in different uh, directions to contain the virus, to take the appropriate measures, and at the same time they refuse to accept passively whatever the president says. How long is this going to uh, last? Are, are these natural immune defenses of the American system going to last and protect us from uh, 
uh, Trump's totalitarian temptations that are being uh, reinforced by the pandemic? I think they will. And what we've seen this, what's happening now is, is just all the more tragic because it's literally a life or death situation. But Trump's been, uh, so, so authoritarian reader, leaders rule by, it's called divide and rule. So they like to pit everybody against each other to keep, they like to keep us apart. They like to keep us at each other's throats. So what he's doing with governors is a classic, it's also mafia um, methods. And Trump has decades of connections with the mafia. He acts just like a mafioso. So he rewards loyalists and he punishes those who are not loyal enough or who are Democrats or who criticize him. And he doesn't care if, if you live or die, if the states have high death rates. He just cares about consolidating his power. It's a very bleak thing to say, but unfortunately, it's, that's how these guys are. And so he's used the crisis to um, kind of uh, manipulate uh, his control of resources, um, doling them out in ways that will you know, punish those who are trying to get them uh, put pressure on them if, to save their own people by coming to heal, by submitting to him. So that's been a very interesting, if, if disturbing, thing to observe. Uh, Ruth, you mentioned uh, media, uh, fake news. Uh, you have become, you, you are a professor, a very established, very renowned professor, an authority in your field. You have become a media personality in the past five, six, seven years especially because of your expertise in totalitarianism, uh, European fascism, that of course has become a sort of term of comparison uh, that has been used sometimes uh, um, arbitrarily, uh, but sometimes appropriately in the current situation. So your insight from a media perspective, now I'm asking Ruth, the media personality, um, how is the role of the media changed? Uh, has it changed for the better? Uh, under these circumstances, under under duress, like we we find ourselves, uh, or not, and what is the role that you see for the media, for the for for the present and for the immediate future in dealing with the pandemic and in dealing with the totalitarian temptations that come with it? That's such a great question. Um, something rather groundbreaking happened the other day. CNN had the Chiron, which is the message at the bottom of the screen. Um, and they said that Trump's um, press conference turned into a propaganda session. I think they even said state propaganda. There are those of us who have been uh, <laughs> urging CNN. I, I even gave a talk, a uh, behind the scenes talk to CNN producers uh, in 2019 to counsel them on how to avoid falling into Trump's traps. But they weren't ready to uh, declare uh, a spade a spade, so to speak. And this life or death situation where people, uh, Chris Cuomo of CNN, was, was he lost 13 pounds in three days. Nobody is spared. And what's interesting about this pandemic is that there, there could be people, I'm not talking about the news media now, but who like his racism, who agree with it all over the world, these global right, right leaders. But the pandemic doesn't care about your race, your faith, or anything. It gets everybody. So it's a leveler. So the news media, I think, is waking up, uh, if it hadn't before, those individuals who were not ready to wake up before. And, and they're being more aggressive because it is a life or death situation. And that is something that is positive for the future. I have long thought that the model that America needs to embrace, and people weren't ready to do it, I mean, I've thought this for like over two years, is that it's now, it's, it's the state media and on the opposition. Um, it's very hard because news media want to be impartial and, and they don't want to be uh, claimed to be partisan hacks. But it's not possible to be fully objective and do the both sides. This both sides business doesn't work when you have an authoritarian who is out to kill everyone and, and sub subjugate everyone. So I think there are some hard truths being learned right now, and I think that it can um, make things better for the future. And Ruth, what I've been noting like on social media and so on is that among all the confusion and the fact that everybody and their mothers are saying something about the virus, even without any specific training or knowledge of it. Um, on one hand, that has created a lot of confusion. 
And on the other hand, it has created a need for people to be more discriminant with the sources from which they get their news. Uh, so I think that on some level, what I've noticed, but I'm very curious to, to hear your take on it, since you're much more uh, of a media person than I am, uh, do you find that there is this uh, need to double check your news and especially that the source from which the news come has become more important? Um, we have received a lot in Italy, a lot of like um, sound bite on WhatsApp. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And we didn't know who they were from. People identify themselves, I work in a hospital, without even saying that whether they were nurses or doctors, and they would give you terrifying accounts of things that were going on. Were they true? Were they not? Were they uh, recorded really by the people that they said they were or not? And I noticed that that has disappeared almost completely. People are no longer interested in, in this is my, again, my very personal experience, in these sort of, almost secret anonymous insights on things that go on or conspiracies. That was another big thing. And my impression is that now people are really thirsty for news that can be relied on. And the source the news come from is probably one of the best ways to make sure that it's of a certain quality. Is that my wishful thinking or do you think there is something to it? There is something to it. And the, the, it's a lot more difficult in the United States because there are there are decades of Fox News indoctrination. There's a very um, uh, kind of strong far right extremist environment, and it has its own media uh, ecosystem. So the same at the same moment, a uh, media columnist uh, wrote yesterday that at the same moment that CNN had the had the message that this was a propaganda session. Fox News had a message that the president is being victimized by the liberal media, which is the victimhood complex is very important to the authoritarian playbook. So there are two realities, many people have said that, in America. And I am hopeful that as people fall ill, um, which I don't want anyone to be falling ill, but I'm hopeful that the outcome of people who were uh, indoctrinated to uh, Trump you know, Fox News universe, as the virus affects their families, they may see that what he was telling them, that what Fox News was telling them was not correct. Because we've seen from the experiences of fascism that um, subtracting yourself, freeing yourself from the climate of lies only happens when you or your family are personally affected. So one of the things I found, which is nothing, nothing new, but it, it, it's important in this big context, is that the, the leader cult, the personality cults of Mussolini and Hitler, only really uh, ended when those countries started getting bombed. When the bombs were falling and they realized Mussolini hadn't had adequate anti-aircraft, anti-air war um, defenses for them. Um, and 1942 was when things started to turn, the first strikes appear in Italy. So you have to have a kind of on the ground calamity. I'm not comparing our situation to Italy, which had 20 years of fascism, but there are people who've been indoctrinated by Fox News and allied ecosystems for years. And also Trump's had a bonanza. It's a, he has carried on a, a, a disinformation campaign without precedent in the history of America. Uh, the, the intensity and the scope of what he's done. So these people are going to need to, to see with their own eyes that something is not right uh, before they're able to come out of it. And Ruth, do you see any positive sign? Uh, we said, of course, this is a terrible uh, international scenario in which we are living right now. But is there any sign that this might be a wake-up call for people or not? Or am I still wishful thinking? Well, one very interesting thing we have to hold on to is that the coronavirus came at a very interesting moment in history because it came at a time when mass protest, on the street protest, was at a high point all over the world. Not just Hong Kong, but also in Santiago, in Chile, the biggest protest since the end of the Pinochet years. Um, and and in, in Russia, protests have become, you know, kind of daily, not daily, but a very frequent occurrence. 
So all of those energies, um, they haven't died, they're sheltering, so to speak. I also think that this experience of social distancing makes us appreciate all the more uh, the horizontal ties, the strength of civil society, because authoritarian rule is about vertical ties, you and the leader, you saluting the leader. And as you, many of the viewers will know, that those regimes do everything possible to keep us from connecting with each other. So this virus has the potential to, to wake people up, to fake news, to make people appreciate those horizontal bonds and caring and compassion. We've seen so many examples of compassion and selflessness. Um, there could be revival of faith. There, uh, many things can happen in a, in a life-changing cataclysmic um, moment like this one. So I am hopeful that even if the short term may be more authoritarian rule in some places, the longer term will be a, a movement for a more just and more caring society. Thank you. This, this is like a, a message of hope that we all need desperately. And coming for you, it's particularly important. But I need to go back to Trump. One, I have one more question, Ruth. Uh, what would be this uh, regarding Trump? And then we are, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, what would be the sign that he has decided to go straight ahead uh, in his totalitarian plans, uh, moving the date of the election? Is it something that he can actually do? Because there have been rumors about it, that he could move the November elections and postpone it. Uh, is, is it something that constitutionally he can do? Is there somebody who can stop him? Is that what we can expect? Uh, and how should we react should that happen? I'm not a constitutional expert. I, I don't think he can uh, just suspend the election. Uh, and, and here we have to talk about voter suppression. And that is not to be blamed all on Trump. The GOP is the real villain here. And Trump is just a vehicle for the GOP. And that just like that's how all these authoritarians got to power because conservative elites thought they could use them for their own ends. So the GOP has been engaging in uh, racial, racialized voter suppression for, for decades. And we've already seen that where they're postponing primaries um, or they're forcing people to turn out in person um, Trump doesn't want any mail uh, voting by mail, and he said that that's very corrupt. So when you hear him say things, just flip it and, and think the opposite. It's not that it's corrupt, it's that it's actually going to allow us to protect our democracy. So you just flip everything that he says. And, and in the case of the pandemic, probably voting by mail would be a great part of how people decide to vote if they're given a choice, because that would keep them... Uh, safe if the situation doesn't improve dramatically in the next few months, uh, voting by mail would be a great way to exercise our constitutional rights without exposing ourselves to unnecessary risks. So the fact that Trump sees that as a sort of a threat and something that he doesn't like says a lot about how useful it could be actually in this situation, right? To totally. And the other thing it avoids is... I um, in 2016, there were um, groups of, of uh, militiamen and armed people, Second Amendment people, hanging around uh, polling places. They were hanging around Hillary Clinton headquarters uh, in, in locally. And I don't know if you remember that uh, Trump staged this uh, a few months ago in Charlottesville that uh, uh, many, many armed people, including people with five foot long guns, you know, assault weapons, they all gathered. And uh, I, uh, my bleak view on things, uh, seasoned wisdom, told me that this was him. This was a performance that he was letting the nation know that he could command these people and get them to come out. So if you vote by mail at home, in the privacy of your own home, you also uh, take away these people's uh, usefulness to him. Because if you're voting at home, you're not going to the polling place where they can hang around and point their assault rifle at you. Um, so the frame we have to use to think of these things is unfortunately no longer democracy, but like a military junta uh, or other regime where you have voter intimidation in person. Uh, so we're going to see him fight. Even perhaps he's not going to bail out the post office. I think he'd rather see the post office go out of business than allow mail uh, in mail, you know, mail voting. 
And that's, uh, that's, that's how it is. Ruth, you, you gave us some reason for hope and you gave us very strong warnings and we are very grateful for both because they, they come from you and they come from somebody who has devoted her life and her career to studying these phenomena, to deconstruct them and to help us demystify them. And that's really when people wonder, what is the use of history? I would answer, look at Ruth ben Giet's research and that's what history is for today. And I want to close really with a, with a uh, nice, uh, open and uplifting note. I want to know what you do once you close your computer and your books about these horrible strong men you spend a lot of hours with to relax, to have uh, some good time on your own. Do you read? Do you watch something? What do you do? To, to keep your balance and to remain so together despite the bad company you're forced to be with uh, for long hours in a day. Yes, I have to say writing the book was not fun. Um, to, to live with those people in your head for a year and a half was not fun. So um, I read Vogue magazine. I look, I do a lot of yoga. I find yoga extremely, uh, it teaches you mental discipline as well as uh, love and compassion. And um, I also, now I've relocated temporarily outside of New York City. I'm enjoying nature. Nature is very important. Um, the solidity of looking at um, the ground and the trees. Um, and, you know, in 1994, uh, I had been in the uh, earthquake in California And it was very, I had to escape in the middle of the night from a building uh, filled with gas. And I went straight to Rome. And I remember walking along the, uh, touching the stone of the Quirinale um, and touching other old, like uh, old buildings and finding comfort in the solidity of the stone. So I've been doing uh, similar things, uh, touching nature. And I think it's important to be grounded. Uh, we can't all do that. Uh, um, be in touch with nature, but we can also speak to our friends and, and, and keeping up with friends uh, and seeing faces is very important. Thank you. I, I love the combination of Vogue magazine, yoga and nature. It's unbeatable and you're the best. And we're going to get you back when the book is ready and out to Casa Italiana. It's going to be a huge party because we are going to celebrate your research and your commitment to democracy and to the values we all stand for. And before letting you go, I just want to remind our listeners that our next Tutti a Casa is going to be with Enio Ranaboldo, who is a member of the board of the Casa and the CEO of Martin Bauer North America. With Enio, we're going to, uh, the title of his talk is going to be Home Sweet Home, Remote Working, Great Reads and Sublime Teas. So join us on Friday, same time, 5 p.m. Uh, New York time and 11 di sera in Italia. And uh, the conversation with Ennio is going to be, uh, yeah, Friday at 5. This coming Friday, April 17th. Thank you again very much, Ruth. You were wonderful as usual. It was a great pleasure talking to you. Thank, Thank you. you. I enjoyed it.